Amen and amen. I appreciate that prayer, Brother Robert. That's, uh, that's exactly the way I want to start off preaching on the subject matter this morning. Because we all ought to have a good attitude towards God's law. You know, unfortunately, there's a lot of churches these days that want to shy away from so much of the Bible, especially found in the Old Testament. And there's this almost dichotomy between people wanting to just embrace only one aspect of God's Word or one, one side of God's Word that is just a total positive only message that's only, hey, everything's great, you're fine, God loves you, God bless you, brother, keep doing what you're doing and continue on with your life. But anyone that's read the entire Bible knows that that's not the whole truth. There's a lot to God's Word that we need to know. The Bible says, you know, in many places, you know, how love I thy law. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. There's so many things that we're, that we're admonished to do. And, and, you know, even after you're saved, yeah, we're saved by the grace of God. Amen. It has nothing to do with our obedience to God's law. We didn't have to keep the law to be saved. But now people have turned that on their head of just saying, well, we're free from the law, so who cares about the law? Well, no, because the Bible still says, be ye perfect and sin not. And in order not to sin, sin is the transgression of the law. So after you're saved, if we're still supposed to not sin, then we need to be aware of God's law. We need to know God's law. We need to know the things that make God extremely angry and things that he calls abominable so we can avoid them and not do them so we can be walking right by God. And in Deuteronomy chapter 23, there's a lot of statements here. And we're not going to go through all of them by any means. There's a few that I really want to focus on for the sermon this morning. That unfortunately, many people, many pastors are avoiding because it's going to make people maybe leave their church if you actually do preach on it. It's going to convict people. It's going to, you know, do what the Bible, do what God's Word is supposed to do. It's going to divide, and that's the way it is. But see, we're not called to withhold God's Word. We're called to preach all of the counsel of God. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Now, hopefully, your heart is right. You love God. You love God's Word. And whatever is taught, as long as what I'm saying is lining up with Scripture, is lining up with what the Bible actually says, then hopefully you'll be able to receive this message because in today's day and age, this stuff isn't popular. This is, this is something that people will say, oh, wow, you're crazy. You know, people want to have this real shallow Christianity where they get to pick and choose certain parts of the Bible they like and just kind of hold to that and ignore the rest. And we're not going to ignore the rest. Amen. We need to know everything. Now, one of the reasons, one of the, what, what, the title of my sermon this morning is Virginity, Fornication, and bastards. Now, before you get all upset because I said the word bastard, if you didn't notice, when we're reading God's word, it talks about bastards in God's word. Okay? Now, the Bible, God's word is holy, it's pure, every word of God is pure. Now, we don't want to just go around and misuse words. But at the same time, there's nothing profane. There's no profanity found in God's word. You know, people have a, have a, have a mixed up notion sometimes of what words are swear words or bad words. Now, look, I'm not for going around and using a bunch of four letter words and stuff. I think it makes you look like ignorant fool. I don't think any people are going to treat you seriously when you talk to them. If you go around using a bunch of filthy language that, that you ought not to be speaking anyways. But to call a word that's a Bible word filthy is just completely false because now you're, now you're judging God when he uses, you know, what he uses in his word. For example, one time I was out soul winning and, you know, the person didn't really want me to say that multiple times, not just one time. The person didn't want me to say the word hell in front of their kid or in front of their child, right? Because they think it's like a swear word. Well, you know how many times hell is found in the Bible? No, it's not a swear word. It's not a curse word. It's, I mean, there is a curse to it. I mean, hell is a curse, right? But it's not a bad word. It's not something we shouldn't be saying with our mouth because it's inherently wrong or evil. It's a word actually that needs to be used a lot more often because people need to understand that their hell is a real place. Well, bastard is another one of those words. It's not something that, you know, in today's society, it seems to have turned into like this swear word. Now, is there a negative connotation associated with that word? Absolutely. Do people 
sometimes maybe misuse that word? Sure. They probably do. But you know what? There's a good reason why it still has a negative connotation because it is negative. Because a bastard is a person, it's a child who's born out of wedlock. When, when a couple decides to fornicate, when, when a man and woman get together and they fornicate and they're not married and they have a child and they're still not married and that child is an illegitimate child, that is a bastard. That's what a bastard is. Now what I want to point out here in Deuteronomy 23, verse number 2 the Bible says, A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Now, when you read the Bible and you go, Wow, that seems harsh. Pay attention to that. Because that means that your concept of right and wrong is screwed up. And the reason why it's screwed up is because this society has been programming you into thinking certain things are acceptable. So when you look at this and say, wow, I mean, how can it be that, that a bastard is not going to be allowed in the congregation of the Lord for 10 generations? I mean, that's a long, 10 generations is a long time. That's hundreds of years for 10 generations to go by and say, nope, the bastard is not going to be allowed in the, in the congregation of the Lord. It's a big deal to God for there to be children born out of wedlock. Now, in today's American culture, it's, it's, it's acceptable. It's practically promoted. With all the, the fornication that's going on, the fornication that's being pumped into your mind through the wicked Hollywood movies and the music and everything else, just promoting a promiscuous lifestyle, promoting just... Oh, you get pregnant? Well, you can either kill the child or just go ahead and have it, but don't worry about getting married. Just empowering single women. Yeah, you go, girl. Just have your baby. You don't need that man. You know, and this, this, this distorted, wicked, satanic lifestyle and, and mindset that's being programmed into people to where now, you, you know, even Christians are going to read God's word and say, wow. Wow, why would you do that? Why? Because we're supposed to be holy. Because marriage is something that's supposed to be exalted and upheld extremely high. It's supposed to be held in very high regard. That's why God did not just allow for divorce under every, every circumstance like the Pharisees were trying to get Jesus to say. Well, can a man divorce his wife for any reason? Uh, no. There was actually one specific event that could happen where it was part of the law as being allowable. But Jesus even said from the beginning it was not so. He said, For God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. That's what God designed us for. Amen. He designed the man and woman to come together in marriage and stay together till death do ye part. That's God's plan. Amen. If you want to do what's right, that's doing right. <clears throat> but this statement we see here in Deuteronomy 23, this ought to underscore how God feels about children born out of wedlock and how much he despises it. It is that important, and we can't just overlook this. Now, we're going to jump down to verse number 17 because, of course, bastards are produced by fornication through people committing the sin of fornication. Look at what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 23, verse number 17. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel. What's a whore? A whore is someone that's going to go at like a prostitute, right? You go and sleep around and, and just shack up with guys. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow, for even both these are abomination unto the Lord thy God. What's abominable? Whores and sodomites. Both are abominable. Now, in case there's, there's any confusion here, you know, it mentions whores, sodomites in verse 17. It mentions whores and a dog in verse 18, equating a sodomite to a dog. Amen. That's God's view of sodomites. Yet again, in today's culture, today's society, oh no, we should love them, accept them, embrace them, bring them into the church. Not in this church. God forbid that 
an abomination is going to be brought into this church. A sodomite is going to be brought into the house of the Lord. Now, flip back, if you were to Deuteronomy chapter 22. We're going to see how much, how, how important virginity is in God's word and how important it is to be, to be married pure. Now look, I know that this isn't popular today and let me just state this too. You know, we're a room full of a bunch of sinners and a lot of us have grown up in a, in a wicked lifestyle. Maybe you weren't saved, especially until later on in life, whatever. And, you know, if you're guilty of, of any of these things that we're preaching about this morning, you know, the, the point of the sermon isn't just to beat this over your head, okay? If you've done wrong and you haven't already confessed and forsaken that to God, then you ought to do that. But the main purpose of sermons like this is to warn those who have not made the mistakes yet so they don't go down the wrong path. So that we could teach the children that are sitting in service this morning, hey, you need to be pure. God treats us as a very, very, very big deal. Even if the whole world around you thinks, oh, it's no big deal. Not a big, not a big problem. Oh, of course, everybody goes off to college and there they go and, and just sow their wild oats and, and that's just the way life is. No, it's not according to God. And no, that wasn't always the norm either. In fact, it was way different from that when people were actually had reverence for God's law and had respect unto God's word, which we ought to be respecting God's word. So let's look at Deuteronomy 22, because look, this is going to help us get our heads straight. There's been a lot of conditioning and programming going on, and we need to make sure that we are right in God's word. Look at uh, verse number 13. Deuteronomy 22, verse number 13. If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her and give occasions of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. Now, that phrase, I found her not a maid, means she's not virgin. So what the situation here is that a man marries a woman, he goes to his wife and for whatever reason he finds out or he thinks he's supposed to say, she's not really a virgin. She was supposed to be a virgin when we got married because that's just the assumption. All throughout the Bible, that's the assumption, is that virgins are getting married. I mean, without fail, that, that, this, is, this is who people are looking for to get married to, are virgins. So he comes in and says, well, I found her not to be a maid. Now, maybe that's because she's with child, you know, and, and that becomes apparent, or she has some type of disease that he didn't know about, obviously, before getting married. Now, all of a sudden, he finds out, oh, wait, wait a minute. You know, there's only one way you can get this disease. So things like that, he says, hey, I found her not a maid. So let's see how the Bible deals with this situation. Verse number 15. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate, and the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid. And yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity, and they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. So basically what's, what's happening here is they're proving that, yes, when they were married, my daughter was virgin, and they're able to supply some evidence that they retain in order to keep the honor of their daughters. And look, who's called upon? The, the parents, the mother and the father, to say, no, our daughter was virgin. She was raised, right? We did watch out for her. We didn't allow her to go off and commit fornication. And you know what? That's the job of the parents today, too. We're giving way too much freedom to these, to these children, especially when they're going through puberty and having all kinds of things going on in their bodies, and just allowing them to just go off unchaperoned and just, you know, do whatever. And they meet these, these kids and, 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 you know, kids are getting involved in these relationships earlier and earlier these days. And look, it's the job of the mo mom and dad to make sure that doesn't happen. And I don't care if, if there's a stigma about it or people say, oh, man, I can't, you're, you're overprotective of your child. Well, you better believe I'm going to be protective of my daughters. Because when you look at how important virginity is in the Bible... 
You better believe I'm going to make sure that my daughters retain theirs until the day they get married, until they leave father and mother and cleave unto their husband. And until that day, they're staying with me in my house. I'm not just going to send them off to college or send them off to live on their own. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, for this cause shall man leave father and mother. For that cause, for, for marrying somebody else. They're going to stay with me until then. Why? Because I'm their father and I'm going to be responsible to make sure, to the best of my ability, that no, my daughter will be a maid on her wedding day and no one's going to be able to say otherwise if, they, if for whatever reason they decide not to like her or whatever, that no, she was pure. You, are, you aren't getting something different than you thought you were getting. So they bring the tokens of my daughter's virginity. I'm not going to go into detail about what that is, but if you're an adult, you probably know what, I'm, what that's talking about there. And they're going to say, look, see, this proves it. Our daughter was a virgin. Here are the tokens. Here's the evidence that um, when they came together, my daughter was a virgin. Verse number 18 says, And the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him, and they shall immerse him in a hundred shekels of silver, and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife. He may not put her away all his days. So this was a big deal. This is enough to, for, him, for, the, for the man who makes that accusation to pay a hundred shekels of silver. That's not just some small change there. That's a significant amount. And notice, it goes on to the father of the damsel because the father was the one responsible. You know, it brings a bad name, not only on the daughter, but on the father because the father's the one who's supposed to be responsible for making sure that his daughter is a maid. And when her name is brought through the mud, his name's brought through the mud and they say, no, that's not right. You can't just do that. You, have to, you owe him now because you've brought a bad report upon his name and upon a virgin of Israel. And you're saying, you know, you're not allowed by law because she didn't commit fornication, which is the reason for the biblical reason for divorce in the, mar in, in the Bible. She didn't commit fornication. Therefore, you can't put her away. You have to remain married to who you married. Because that's another thing that the Bible, that God takes seriously is our vows. When you vow a vow unto the Lord, which is what you're doing when you say your wedding vows, and you're vowing to be with someone till death do us part, God expects you to keep those vows. And he says, look, you're the one, you know, that's why it's important, you know, you shouldn't just flippantly get married to somebody. Make sure you're, you're getting married to someone who you're going to want to spend the rest of your life with because there is no backing out once you get married, that's it. Verse number 20, but if this thing be true, so that's, that was the case if, if the guy was just lying. The husband was saying it, but it wasn't really true. She really was a virgin. But now let's say it's true. It says, yeah, you know what? She wasn't a maid. And the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house. And the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house, so shalt thou put evil away from among you. By the way, those aren't my words. Those are God's words. So anyone who has a problem with that judgment on a daughter of Israel that plays a whore, take it up with God, because that's the way that God feels about it. That's the way that he said is appropriate to deal with this problem. Now, if we had anything even remotely close to this in place as being a consequence for your actions of committing fornication or just like with adultery, you know, the Bible puts adulterers to death. It's a death penalty sentence against someone who commits adultery. I guarantee you there would be a lot less adultery than what's going on in our world right now. A lot less fornication when you consider the gravity of doing such a thing. See, it's easy now when your flesh is tempting you and saying, oh yeah, commit this act and, and driving you into doing something that maybe you don't even really want to do. You've been taught that, yeah, this is wrong. I shouldn't do this. It's a lot easier to come up with the excuses to then just go ahead and commit fornication, go ahead and commit adultery because there's no consequences for it in this world. Now there is still according to God. If you're a born again believer, you better believe you're not getting away with it. Now, I'm not talking about going to hell. 
I'm not about God chastising you and disciplining you in this life because you're a child of God if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. He will punish you. You don't get away with anything. But sometimes it's harder for people, especially if you're on the verge of committing fornication or adultery, to remember that God actually exists and that he is going to punish you for it. But people have a lot more tendency to remember, hey, there's a government that's going to take care of this problem. If I do this, here's what's going to happen. I might actually lose my life over this. That's the way that God deals, feels about fornication. Jump down to verse number 28 there in Deuteronomy 22. Because now we're going to see, that was, see, the, the, the first situation was someone who was married, who was supposed to be virgin and was not. Okay? That was someone who, um, prior to the, to the, the, um, the marriage, you know, coming together, before, before, prior to the, um, I can't think of the word. Prior to the, to the man and woman coming together and that were married, consummation. consummation, thank you, the consummation of the marriage, the, uh, you know, that event had taken place, and that's the, the result of that. Now, at the end of Jude Deuteronomy 22 here, near the end, in verse number 28, this is this, the, an instance of someone who's fornicating with a virgin, but they're not married, there's no marriage involved. This is just fornication outside of marriage completely. Verse number 28 the Bible reads, if a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her and lie with her, and they be found. Now, people have I've heard criticisms, and I've preached on this in the past, and I'm not going to spend all the time to go through it uh, this morning, but atheists and people who hate the Bible want to point to this verse and say, oh yeah, see, you know, this is someone who's, who's forcing a girl or raping her and saying that the Bible says, well, you have to marry her. That's not what, the, what this verse is stating. Now, if you're reading a modern translation or perversion of God's word, that is what it says. And that's where people are getting this concept from is because if you read like an NIV or a New Living Translation or whatever, these other versions will have that in there, that verse 28 is talking about someone who's forcing a girl. That's not what this verse is saying at all. It's just saying that, hey, a man finds a damsel, she's a virgin, she's not betrothed. Now, laying hold and lying with her, that doesn't mean forcibly. He's laying hold of her and, and, and lying with her. I mean, that's what, that's what men do when they lie with women. It's not, it's not, it has nothing to do with being against her will or anything like that. Because there's a whole other section that talks about women who, you know, th they cry out. And then, of course, she's not punished because she didn't do anything wrong if she's, if she's trying to stop it and she's calling out for help, right? The rapist gets put to death. That's a death penalty in the Bible for rape. And, you know, but then if, if she doesn't say anything and she's consensual to it, then that's a whole other act. But what's happening here, this isn't rape. This isn't force. This is just a man lying with a virgin. And then they be found they be found because they're committing this act. Verse 29 says, Then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife because he hath humbled her. He may not put her away all his days. So obviously this is a lesser charge, but still important. And what the Bible is teaching here is that, okay, when a man lies with a, with a virgin, he ought to marry her. That's what ought to happen. And, and on top of that, he has to pay a fine because now he's humbled this virgin and, and that's not the right way to do it, obviously, and it brings a stain against that person. And, um, but the right thing to do then is just to get married. If you love her enough to lay with her, then you should love her enough to marry her. So the Bible is clearly teaching here that if fornication happens, they ought to get married and pay the father for defiling his daughter. Now, our culture has brainwashed people into thinking, well, of course kids won't remain virgin until their wedding day. Of course, I mean, that's just, I mean, just forget about that nonsense in today, you know, in our trendy, progressive era that we live in today. Oh, yeah, huh, maybe that's something the kids used to do back in the 40s and 50s, but not today. That would never happen today. Yeah, part of the reason is because you're, you're telling people that that and you're brainwashing people into thinking and having that attitude. 
But then they say, oh yeah, you know, that's not going to happen. So let's just give them birth control pills. Let's just give them these contraceptives so that you can be safe just in case you do go off and commit some abominable act. Just in case you do go off and commit fornication. Now look, there's nothing safe about having that relationship outside of marriage. There's nothing safe about it. I don't care what uh, you know, death pills you're ingesting or what type of contraceptives you use. It's not safe. And it's not safe because there's a God in heaven. There's a God that hates fornication. Leviticus 19.29, I'll just read this for you. It says, Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. See, when people start teaching their daughters to become whores, by giving them contraceptives, by giving them birth control, and just sending off this message of saying, well, you shouldn't be fornicating, but here you go, here's all the tools to do it just in case, just so that it could lessen the ramifications of you, you know, committing. I, I remember going through this in, in high school. I mean, this was being taught. I don't think the, the, uh, the contraceptives were actually available. I think they were just starting to introduce them into schools when I, when I was going through high school, which was like in the mid-90s. And um, I remember in speech class, there was, that was like one of, the, one of the debate topics I actually picked up on was, you know, in my opinion, still haven't changed on that. If anything, they've gotten a lot stronger than they were in high school. But it's like, what, what message are you, are you telling these kids when you're just saying, well, you shouldn't do this, but here you go. Right. It's like, you, you shouldn't go and get drunk, but here's a case of beer. But you shouldn't do it. But just so you don't go off and steal the alcohol and get thrown in jail for stealing, I'll just provide you with the alcohol. That's the same type of mentality of just, well, here's your, your you know, all the tools that you need to, to minimize an impact of you committing this sin. You know, the reason why the, that, you know, that's why, how children are born and that's how diseases are spread, that's God's design to make sure that you don't have this relationship unless it's within marriage, unless you're dedicated to that person to get married to them and stay with them and, and be responsible for, for raising your children. And you're not just going from person to person. That's why the diseases are there. I mean, it's, it's completely uh, designed by God. But no, wicked man wants to circumvent what God has designed. Jude, verse 7. Turn, if you would, to Leviticus 21. Leviticus 21, Jude verse 7 tells us what happens, the end result of a society that gives themselves over to fornication, like our society is doing. It's going to be no surprise. Of course, the Bible always rings true. Jude verse 7 says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So that's the New Testament saying, hey, remember that story about Sodom and Gomorrah back in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament? Yeah, you know what? In the New Testament, look at that story because that's there for our admonition after the time of Christ to say that's an example of what happens when people give themselves over to fornication, when people go after queer flesh, and just get into all this wickedness, you know what? God judges them. Amen. And there's a judgment that's going to be coming. There's a judgment coming to our country as it stands right now. There's no way judgment is not going to come to this point to where, you know, with people just proudly proclaiming their wickedness and it being tolerated and accepted in our society at large and in our culture at large, this, this notion of just, oh, let them, you know, let them be, and, and, or who are you to judge, right? Yeah, that's what they said to Lot. When Lot tried to prevent them from raping the angels that came in to stay with them, and he's like, don't do so wickedly. Oh, who made you a judge over? You came here to sojourn, and you're going to be a judge? It's funny. Attitudes haven't changed in thousands and thousands of years. We have God's word as our example. 
We know what's going to happen, but it's not just enough to know what's going to happen. We need to be vocal about it and warn other people and warn our children and warn those around us and say, hey, Sodom and Gomorrah was an example. Show me any other place that God rained fire and brimstone down upon to destroy them. Destroyed with hellfire. It's wickedness. You're in Leviticus 21. We're going to see here how the priests <coughs> were told to marry virgins. And that the daughter of the priest would be executed if they played the whore, similar to what we saw in the other chapter in Deuteronomy. Now, um, again, this is all just to emphasize the importance of virginity, the importance of purity, and the importance of just, just you know, refraining from fornication and these sins of the flesh and how God thinks about them and deals with them. Now, we are not under this law today. That's, these aren't the laws of the land. The, the, the Old Testament laws were given to the nation of Israel as the laws that God wanted them to, follow, to institute and to follow and obey. These were their laws. Now, when we look at today, if you think about, you know, if you're asking yourself a question, well, we're not under these laws because we don't live in the Old Testament, we're not Israel. Okay, then if you were just to come up with your own nation, just, just hypothetically, well, I'm the ruler of, I'm the, I'm, you know, all authority is getting given to me in America. Okay? In this country, I've got all authority that's been given to you. You can make whatever form of government you want. You can make whatever laws you want. You are given that power. Would you not want to go to God's word to form and fashion your laws against? I mean, if you really want a true, just, righteous government, why wouldn't you go and look and see, well, how does God view this? How did God make laws to set forth? Are you going to improve on God's laws? Are you more righteous than God? Are you going to say, well, that was kind of harsh. I don't think we should be that extreme. Well, there you've just gone and judged God because God thought that that wasn't extreme. God thought that that was actually justice and judgment being done when he created these laws. And God doesn't change, my friends. His attitude towards all these sins are still, is still the same. These are all moral laws that we're talking about here. This goes to the heart of him creating men and women to begin with. Leviticus 21, we'll just read this pretty quickly because it's, it's very similar to what we've already seen in Deuteronomy. Leviticus 21, verse number 7. The Bible reads, They shall not take a wife that is a whore or profane. Neither shall they take a woman put away from her husband, for he is holy unto his God, which, by the way, are the same requirements for a pastor today. Um, not, it does, it's not spelled out on taking a wife that's a whore, but, but a woman put away from her husband is definitely um, on that list. Verse number 8, Thou shalt sanctify him therefore, for he offereth the bread of thy God, he shall be holy unto thee, for I, the Lord, which sanctify you, am holy. And the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, she profaneth her father, she shall be burnt with fire. And then in verse 13 it says, And he shall take a wife in her virginity, a widow or divorced woman, or profane or an harlot. These shall he not take, but he shall take a virgin of his own people to wife. God's serious about, about these sins and about these offenses. Now, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, because we've seen a lot of Old Testament. And as I mentioned before, you know, we don't just discount the Old Testament. This is the way God viewed it. This is the way God's law talked about it and the, and the punishments that were appropriate for these various sins. But now we're going to see many examples in the New Testament regarding fornication and the way that God feels about it in the New Testament. See if anything's changed. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. Fornication is a serious sin, and I think it's extremely lacking. We need to get back to Bible teaching on this. I'm going to read for you from 1 Corinthians 10, verse 8. The Bible says, let, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. This is a reference back to the Old Testament when the children of Israel sinned in the wilderness, and they commit fornication, the matter of Baal Peor, and in the wilderness, when they're out there, 
thousand people lost their life as a result of their fornication. God killed them. 23,000 people. That's a, that's a big number. That's about half the people that live in Prescott Valley. Just imagine half of our population gone because God was angry about the fornication going on. That's what happened. That's, that's, that, that should be sobering. That should make you say, wow, maybe I ought to pay a little bit more attention to my children. Maybe I ought to really make sure that I'm not giving them opportunity to commit such a wicked act. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 goes over many things that people can do to actually be kicked out of church. And fornication is one of them. Look at verse number 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The Bible says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Paul is saying, I can't believe that not only do you have fornication, but I mean, this is, this is really bad fornication going on. A man taking his father's wife. So supposedly, I would think it's his stepmother. But still, I mean, just total wickedness. And he's saying, I can't believe, basically, that you haven't taken this guy away. And you're still allowing him to just be part of the church and just show up. And just living in this, this wicked fornication. Verse number 9, jump down to verse number 9. He says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. So I told you not to hang around with fornicators. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must you need to go out of the world. So he's going to clarify a statement that he made earlier when he told them not to company with fornicators. He said, I'm not just talking about people that are out in this world, because obviously unsaved people that are out in this world, there's a lot of wickedness out there. And if you were going to just not company with people on, you know, for these reasons, he's saying like, you wouldn't be able to talk to anybody because that's the way that the world operates because Satan is the God of that world. He says, now he clarifies in verse 11, but now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. So you're going to church, and you've got brother so-and-so over there, someone who's saved, they've been coming to church, they're called a brother. So you find out brother so-and-so's in fornication, he's saying don't even eat with that person. You need to put that away from you. You need to, to purge out the leaven because a little leaven's going to leaven the whole lump. And when you see, oh yeah, it's okay for brother so-and-so to be in here and we know that he's in fornication. We know that he's just in this open sin and the kids look to him and other people at church look to him and say, well, well, I guess it's not that big of a deal then because no one's doing anything about it. Right. Well, in this church, guess what? Now, this isn't just any sin. I know we're all sinners. I know none of us are perfect. But there's a big difference between the sins that you might commit on, on, you know, on, on a regular basis and the, some of the sins, that, you know, the sins that are listed in this list. I mean, not everyone is just a fornicator, is just going off and having that type of relationship with people and being a fornicator. That's, that, that, and we have to have a standard somewhere. And this is where God said, the Bible says, this is where the standard is. You know, God knows that we're sinners, but he's saying, you know, when you get involved in this stuff, or if you're a drunkard, or you're a railer, you're an idolater, you're a fornicator, he's saying, don't even eat with those people when they're called brothers, right? I'm not talking about someone who just got saved yesterday, but someone who's a brother, definitely, because people need to be able to grow and learn this, but if someone's called a brother, that person is, is cast out and the Bible also says, I'm not, I didn't have this in my notes, but, you know, hey, if they repent and they get right with God, they're welcome back in. Okay, and this isn't, this isn't uh, you know, in this case, that's not till the 10th generation, right? This, is, this isn't just a, a forever thing, but they're going to be allowed back if they repent. Uh, turn, if you would, to chapter number six. We're just going to see a, a bunch of verses here from the Bible on how serious of a sin fornication is. It's so serious that... Hey, that's a reason for someone not to even be, not to even eat with. 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 9 says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? 
Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Verse number 13, the Bible reads, Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Jump down to verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. So he's saying, look, don't you realize as a believer, as someone who's saved, as someone who has the Holy Spirit residing inside of you, that your bodies are the members of Christ? He said, you're going to take your body that belongs to Christ, that God bought and is housing the Holy Spirit of God, and you're going to make that body one flesh with a harlot, with a whore? Let's keep reading here. Verse 17, but he that has joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. That means run away, screaming in the other direction. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You are completely defiling and trashing the temple of the Holy Ghost when you go off and commit fornication. Maybe with that perspective, you could start to see a little bit more why God gets so angry about it. Yeah. Remember when Jesus Christ came into the temple and cast out those that were buying and selling in the temple? Why? They were defiling the temple because the temple is supposed to be a, a place of a house of prayer for all nations and they're supposed to be in there serving God. And what they do, they made it a house of merchandise. They're buying and selling and getting gain. All of this taking place in God's house, in the temple. So Jesus makes a whip. He flips over their table. He's like, get out of here. Get this garbage out of here. Stop defiling God's temple. How do you think he feels about when your body is being defiled? which is housing the Holy Ghost by committing fornication. It's the same response, my friends. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. <clears throat> and we're start reading verse number 3. Again, more New Testament examples of how wicked fornication is. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. He's saying these things, for these reasons, this is why the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. And the children of disobedience are those who have not obeyed the gospel and gotten saved. The children of disobedience, the wrath of God is abiding on them. Why? Because of all these things. Because their whoremongers are unclean. And I didn't read the rest of that verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, but it says, you know, basically a similar thing, saying, oh, don't you know that neither whoremongers nor covetous have they, have they part in the kingdom of God? He says, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified. You know, the, the reason why we... This isn't talking about us losing our salvation because we commit some sin after you're saved is because we've already been washed through the blood of Christ. So we, we, we have the, the eternal judgment paid for by Jesus Christ. We're washed through the blood of Christ. But let's not be partakers with those who are going to be sent to hell because they're whoremongers and because they're covetous and because they're drunkards. 
We should have no, there, we are what concord hath Christ with Belial? There should be no communion between light and darkness. We shouldn't be like that at all. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, if you'd turn there, please. We're almost done. I've got a couple more places to go. In, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. A lot of people wonder, what's the will of God in my life? Well, I just want to know what God's will is in my life. What is it that God has for me? Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is actually going to tell us what God's will is in your life. This isn't all, but this is definitely one of the things. You want to know what God's will is in your life? Look at verse number three. The Bible says, for this is the will of God. Even your sanctification, being sanctified, being set apart, being holy, getting sin out of your life, your sanctification that ye should abstain from fornication. Withhold, do not commit fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. This is God's will. That you flee fornication, that you are not unclean, that you know how to, how to carry yourself and your body in honor and respectable and not just giving yourself over to these various lusts of the flesh and becoming dirty, unclean, you know, but you ought to be holy. Hebrews chapter 13. It's the last place all of you turn is in Hebrews. We're looking at Hebrews 13 and Hebrews 12. Actually, let's turn if you go to Hebrews chapter 12. See, we live in an unclean, whore and whoremongering society today that's producing a bunch of bastards and destroying the values of purity, virginity, marriage, and family. Family is important. I mean, the family is where you should be drawing your strength from. Family, you ought to be, you know, growing so strong in your family. Your family is going to be there to help keep you together when all kinds of things are going wrong and, and, and going you know, bad in your life, you ought to be able to rely on your family to strengthen you. But when you don't have a family to begin with because people are just going off and whoring around and having children with different guys and, and raising them by themselves, you've completely destroyed the family. And that's been one of Satan's objectives for a long time. And he's done a pretty good job at it, if you ask me, looking around today. But we need to combat that with God's word, with the truth. Hebrews, uh, I have you in Hebrews 12. Hebrews 13, verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. There is a judgment for whoremongers and, and adulterers. The Bible says, hey, you're married. Marriage is honorable in all. Great. You can have that relationship, no problem. It's actually honorable. The bed's undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So, you know, just because, Christian, don't just think, oh, well, you know, it doesn't matter because Jesus paid for all my sins, so I'm good. Well, yeah, just because you don't have to worry about going to hell doesn't mean that God's still not going to judge you on this earth. Doesn't mean that your life here isn't going to go through some serious problems and hard times when you commit such wicked sins. As with many other things in Scripture, God's institutions reflect a greater spiritual truth. So, for example, um, marriage. The Bible talks about in Ephesians chapter 5 how marriage is a symbol or a picture of Christ in the church. And it explains, you know, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. It goes on and on. You can read all of uh, Ephesians chapter 5 near the end there. And it's showing that picture. Well, the family is also uh, very similar. The, the, the family that God has ordained does the same thing. You're in Hebrews chapter 12. Look at verse number 6. Because God the Father, we have a Father in heaven that loves us when we're born again, when we're born into his family, when we're born after that spiritual seed, we become children of God. And God is our Father. 
Hebrews 12, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. This is talking about the discipline that God will give to his children. Now, God chastens or scourges every son he receives. And this ought to be reflective of us in our life with our own children. Because you're not going to get any more loving than God the Father. You're not going to get any more loving than God. He is our Father. If He's going to discipline every son that He receives, we ought to be disciplining our own children and love them enough to, to, to give them the proper discipline when it's needed. Now, God's not just up in heaven just disciplining us every, just every day for everything, no matter what we do. He disciplines us when it's appropriate. But He's still, we all do things that are not appropriate and that need disciplining. If you're a child of God. And then it goes on to explain here, verse 7, it says, If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. It's not a bad thing. It means God loves you. If you're going through, if God's chastening you and disciplining you, you don't have to be that upset about it. You'd be mature enough to say, well, yeah, I, I, I must have done wrong or I know I've done wrong. But at least I know if I'm enduring this chastening that God loves me because he wouldn't be trying to correct me and punish me if I wasn't as, if he didn't love me. He says, For if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? He said, there isn't a son who God doesn't chasten because he chastens all of his sons. But verse number eight says, but if ye be without chastisement whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. And this is the wicked of the world that seem to get away with everything. These are the people that get lifted up and, you know, they have all the money and the fame and living a life of sin and debauchery and everything that we're told in the Bible that we're not supposed to be doing because it's wickedness. They're committing all the fornication, adultery, everything. But they seem to be getting away with it. Why? Because they're bastards, because they're not sons, because they're not born of God. They're not born again. If they were, God would be disciplining them and chastising them and tell them they're wrong. But that's not the case. And you know what? They're not going to get away with it either. Because there is a judgment coming, unfortunately, for those who don't receive Christ as their Savior. And I don't even say unfortunate. It's not unfortunate. I mean, it's unfortunate for them that they didn't put their faith in Jesus, but it's God's righteous judgment. It's going to happen. And it's right that he does send people to hell. Because they reject a free gift that is offered at no cost to them at all. Now, we don't disdain unsaved people by any means. We love them and we want to give them the gospel. They need to get saved. But any unsaved person that goes to hell, it's still a righteous judgment by God. Now, one last point. I just want to bring this up because the Bible talks a lot about the fatherless and widows. A bastard is not someone who's just known as fatherless, even though they might not have a father around. When you, when you read the Bible, you'll see fatherless and widows hand in hand all the time. Because that's a situation where a father passes away. Okay? And God has a special place in his heart for people in that situation. And they're easier to control or to, to take advantage of because they're going through harder times and whatever. But God really looks out and takes a special place for that and for children that are, that are in that position and for widows that are in that position. And he puts a strong condemnation on those that would take advantage of people like that. But that's a totally separate concept. That's why, you know, just in passing, you know, if you've been reading your Bible or you thought about this at all, you know, the concept of people who are fatherless and widows is, is a different situation than those who are just bastards because they were just born out of fornication in, uh, in, in an extremely wicked way. Now, again, I'm not saying that we should hate a bastard child. I mean, of course not. But there is a certain stigma associated with it that ought to be in a society because fornication ought to be so looked down upon that no one would ever want to have a bastard child that, according to the Bible, wouldn't be allowed in the congregation of the Lord until the 10th generation. Like, that's a big deal. And it ought to be a big deal. And we ought to treat it as such to say, look, if you're going to do anything, you know, the Bible says, but, you know, to, uh, to avoid fornication, let them marry. Like, get married. If you, if, you're at least, if you have to have that relationship with someone so bad, get married. Because in marriage, the bed's undefiled. It's, it's honorable. 
We need to get back to, to biblical concepts in, in a biblical frame of mind and stay in your word. And, you know, don't uh, try not to, to, you know, react too poorly to God's word, especially when it might sound extreme to you. And like I said, the reason why it even sounds extreme is because of the society we live in today. That's the only reason. It's because you've been so conditioned to a certain way of thinking. And look, this affects all of us because we're all affected by the world that we live in today. But we need to make sure that we're not judging God's word as being not good because of our conditioning, but that we would change the way that we think to be more conformed to what the Bible says and to exalt the things that need to be exalted and to abase the things that need to be abased and not waver or compromise on our stand according to what God's word says. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear instructions that you give us, God. We thank you that you don't just leave us to our own devices and to just to try to figure out what's right and what's wrong just completely on our own. Because if we were left all alone on this, dear Lord, we would be extremely screwed up and backwards. Lord, um, we thank you for, for giving us these instructions. I pray that you please help us, that our hearts would be open and receptive to changing our own maybe, you know, personal thoughts to be in line with, with what your thoughts are and with what the, your word says. And I pray that you would please just um, help us here to, to live a righteous, holy life to be uh, sanctified and, and to really just obey the will that you have set forth for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.